Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and also joined by the third member of our team, Jacob Puntori of Inside the Penguins, joins the show as we get set to talk about the Penguins prospect situation, not just the three that came in over the past weekend, but also a look in at what Braden Yeager has done, the first round pick of 2023, and also Owen Pickering, first round pick of 2022. We're going to discuss all of this and more with Jacob here over the next couple of minutes. But Jake, before we get into that, simply, how you been doing? It's been a while since we've connected. Oh my gosh, Nick, it's it's great to see you. Nick, I, I feel like we, Horowat, I mean, we talk like every day, but we text at least every day, so, you know. Fine, well, yeah. you. Berlansky. Great to see you, buddy. <laughs> Doing all right. I'm really happy to be here, though, guys. Thank you so much. You know, we keep in touch every day because you know you're, you're continuously putting stuff out on the website every day for every game. You know, every time I'll throw you a story. You've been great uh, to have around. A great piece for this team. And I mean, you know what? The Penguins added to added to their piece added pieces to their team. And uh, we're curious to hear uh, your thoughts on all of it because I like to refer to you as our go-to prospect guy because. Uh, mm. I can barely keep up with this NHL team sometimes. It's a lot to keep up with, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm happy to happy to chat prospects. I mean, you know, I think we can dive right in if you guys are ready. But I mean, I I, I got some. I think I got some fun takes for this one. Awesome. Well, obviously, you know, following the Penguins prospects the last couple of years has been a lofty preposition simply because there's not a lot of great ones. There's not a lot of top tier ones, and the general consensus around the NHL, at least following the trade of Jake Gensel was they got a couple more to add here, a couple top tier, a couple higher tier prospects. And I think we should start with the one that we're going to see probably the soonest. And that's Vasily Ponomarev, who we could be seeing as early as this month. Kyle Dubas mentioned that he's going to start at the AHL level, but he might get a run here towards the end of the season where he joins the NHL squad, plays a couple of games. He has two games played at the NHL level this season already with the Carolina Hurricanes. Where do you think he would fit best with this current lineup? Obviously, things have been moving and shaking since the trade deadline, but what line or what line mates do you see him succeeding with once he joins the NHL squad and if he joins the NHL squad this season? Yeah, well, I mean, personally, I would love to see him get at least a crack, get a, give him a couple mm-hmm. games up at the NHL level. I think he was impressive in those two games. I mean, Carolina has that log jam at forward, so I think it just sort of created, you know, it just wasn't going to fit there, whatever. But I think he really, with Lars Eller moving up and seeing some time in the top six and, and getting more of an elevated role, I think it kind of paves the way for Pon- Panamarev. Pronounce, help me out there. Panamarev? I Panamarev. think it's the, way, it's the way Dubas said it, so I, I don't know. That's what we're sticking with. I messed it up 18 times on Friday. So so sorry to this guy, especially if he sticks. Uh, but I think it really paves the way for him to be a, a third-line center. I think that really is the ceiling for him. Um, you know, he does – have some scoring touch. I don't think he's been talked about too much as being like a super flashy scorer or like a, you know, a Selkie candidate. I don't, I don't think anyone's got these sort of lofty expectations for him, but I mean, he works really hard. He can score his first goal in the NHL was, you know, it looked like a, a, a goal scorers goal. He takes this one timer in the slot and buries it. Um, so I think if, if he's going to get a crack anywhere, it's going to be somewhere on the third line. Uh, and I think that could him with maybe an Emo Benstrom, uh, or even, you know, if they're going to give him someone like a Brian Rust or a Ricard Raquel, maybe a veteran could help uh, to sort of see if he really does have that offensive potential. Uh, but at the least, I think he's going to at least come in and be a bottom six player that can compete uh, at the earliest next season. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing of what Kyle Dubas mentioned is a lot of these young guys, and he talked about it before the trade deadline when he had that press conference with the you know local media and Horwat included in that, said they want to get younger. And part of that is these young guys are going to get an opportunity. He already mentioned you know Ponomarev potentially coming up this season, as you mentioned, maybe a third-line role would fit for him. And also, you know, Vili Koivunen, somebody that is tearing it up right now in Finland, somebody that you know, Kyle Dubas also mentioned, you know, they would like to see him come over and potentially, you know, vie for a spot next season in North America. Now that becomes a little bit of a heavier proposition because you have to make that jump from bigger ice over in Finland to that shorter ice and that, you know, shorter time to react on North American, you know, soil because we've seen that with Joel Blomqvist, different position entirely, but we've seen him have to make that adjustment this year and do it well. But what do you think is the biggest challenge that a guy like Koi Vunin is going to face when he comes over to North America, whether that's at the AHL level next season or whether that is with the big club, if he gets a crack out of camp next year with the Penguins. 
Yeah, uh, I think you touched on it a bit here, Berlansky, but uh, the skating is really the one thing that sticks out that isn't, you know, great. I mean, he's having an incredible offensive season. He's a play driver. He can score. He can dish it. I think he can bring all of that, and it'll translate into the AHL and probably into the NHL eventually. Uh, but the skating is it, it's just sort of fine, um, you know, so I, I'm curious to see. He struggled a little bit in his very brief. I think he had about 10 or 11 games in the AHL last year once his season ended over uh, in the Finnish league. So maybe he can come over again and see if he's a little bit better adjusted to the pace or if maybe that confidence from having a really explosive offensive season can sort of get him there. Uh, but yeah, is that reaction time, is the skating enough to sort of give him the space to use all of that skill that he's clearly possessing? Uh, and I really like that Dubis um, talked about him being like, you know, maybe overlooked in a way and sort of being like lost in the shuffle of all these really talented young forwards in Carolina because they had truly a glut of them. Um, so I, I think he's going to get a, a much quicker road to getting a, a bigger opportunity in Pittsburgh. So, you know, I'm trying to be as optimistic as possible with these guys, but I, I do think if there's anyone who's going to be like the, uh, the real steal of this or the one who pans out the most, it's probably going to be Koi mm -hmm. And that's interesting. And you mentioned that the uh, hurricanes may have, you know, overlooked some of these guys considering their glut of forwards at pretty much almost at, at the ready for the NHL level. And, you know, we won't dig too much into Cruz Lucius here. We, you know, still are still trying to get the vibe on him almost completely. Uh, but NCAA hockey is usually pretty easy to, for everyone to go out and find. So I think, I don't know where his team stands, but we'll get to learn more about him in the coming, coming weeks, months, years. Yeah. Uh, but where would you say, uh, these three new additions kind of land in the, you know, in the rankings of the Penguins pipeline because, like you said, it's if they're getting overlooked on a team that definitely has a more substantial prospect pool. I mean, these guys got to shoot right up near the top for the Penguins, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Combine that with the fact that the the Penguins just have a, you know, they get ranked 29th, 30th, but you can say they're the worst prospect pool, and I don't think anyone's going to come to their defense. Um, so, you know, I think even with Cruz Lucius, who we, I don't really know much about yet, but I know that Wisconsin's a top five team in the country and they're about to, you know, Frozen Four's coming up. So more eyes are going to be on him and maybe I'll get a better shot at, you know, finding out a little bit more about him. But even so, I mean, he's instantly a top 10 prospect in the organization. Uh, Koi Voonen comes in and he's going to be probably three on it. I think Braden Yeager is still absolutely the top prospect. He's He's probably the best piece to that can maybe make an impact um but between Koivunen and with Pon Ponomarev um <laughs> that they're both top five in the system immediately um and again due to just sort of a lack of it being it's pretty bad already um uh, <laughs> but these guys are going to come in they're top five prospects in the organization for sure mm -hmm. and that's you know that was essentially the goal we know Dubas wanted those top prospects, those guys that can fight for NHL roles right away rather than draft picks. Uh, just real quick before we move on, what were your over overall thoughts on this trade? I mean, it's Jake Gensel out and just these new futures coming in. Yeah, I mean, it it hurts as a as a Penguins fan to see Jake Gensel go. I think the, the writing was on the wall before the season started and there was no contract extension in place that they, he was not going to stay regardless. So um, I think once I got to that, sort of conclusion i felt like any sort of return was great um you know on x it, it felt terrible it seemed like everyone was sure that this organization was getting sold tomorrow and we were just done um and you know i don't think it was the best return i i you know i know emily kaplan mentioned something about um the rangers had like a first and like brendan offman on the table but like you know, I don't I don't think that one fits what Dubas wanted to really get back in terms of replenishing the forward depth in the prospect pool. Um, and I also don't know if that's 100 percent true or if the Rangers really wanted to do that. Um, but I, I think it was a fine trade. You get three pieces. If one of them pans out, you got a player in return for an expiring contract. And, uh, you know, maybe if the Hurricanes go on a run here, they could get a first round pick in addition. But it you know, I, I would say if I'm rating out a scale of like one to 10, I'd give it probably like a six. Um, but I think the fact that they got as many futures back as they did is the, is the real win. Mm -hmm. I'll take a six and we can shift gears here now to we want to discuss about the guys that we have already seen in the system. Like Braden Yeager right now is going to be um, a huge piece of this Penguins future. Just um, this, and this might be a familiar question and even a pretty short answer. Just, uh, you know, how soon can do you think we can expect the Penguins to? give him that NHL call. 
Uh, I think full time, he's still a little bit away. Um, you know, I, I think they're going to give him every preseason game going into next season. I wouldn't be surprised if he sticks around a little bit out of, you know, the preseason as well. I mean, they they love him. And I think justifiably so. He's had an incredible season. His goal scoring's back on on track. Everyone was kind of down on him going into the draft last year because those goals went down from the pre-draft year into the draft year. Um, but they're right back up to where they were. He's one goal behind his pace. Uh, so, I mean, he's he's a two-way player. My only real concern, to be quite honest, is like I don't think he's probably going to be a winger and he's probably not a center. Um, but I mean, he's playing the center position right now in WHL. He's playing a ton of minutes, huge responsibility. Um, he looked pretty solid there when he was there in the World Juniors, but he also played a lot of wing at the World Juniors. Um, so I think the Penguins aren't quite sure. I don't know if anybody is on what his real position will be in the NHL. Um, but I, I mean, if he's not getting some time next season, the season after that, I think he's he's probably going to bypass the AHL. Um, I think he's I think he's that good. It's interesting, too, because you look at, you know, in the history, you know, Jake Gensel, obviously name of the game was a center coming into, you know, whenever he was drafted by the Penguins and then shifted over to wing and became the best winger Sidney Crosby's ever played with. And on a lesser level and more recently, we've seen, you know, Drew O'Connor, who was a natural center, come in and be a winger every day this year, just because that's where the Penguins had a hole. And that's the hole that could get Drew O'Connor, some NHL playing time at a consistent basis. But before he was injured, he bounced back to center. That's something that, you know, we might be able to see over the next season as he bounces back to center, especially, you know, given the fact that Lars Eller might be sticking around, might not be sticking around. Kyle Dubas kind of non-committal on who is going to be here next year and who's not going to be here. Seems like a lot of changes are coming up the pipeline, but the Penguins have historically been pretty open to where players end up moving. I mean, if they're in as a center and they're better fit as a winger, they're willing to do that. Or if they come in as a winger, like a Sam Poulin, they can always transmit to center, which has seemingly worked for Poulin. So I'm not as worried about, you know, if Jaeger ends up turning into a winger or if he stays at a center. But I do think that you see the monster season he's having and you see the, you know, importance that he's put on the two-way game, especially last year. You mentioned that's why his numbers went down as he was told, hey, if you want to be more appealing to NHL teams and NHL general managers, you got to get that defensive side up. So I think he's somebody who is far from a finished product, but certainly a product that is starting to look more and more polished as this season has gone on. It's his fourth year with Moose Jaw, like you mentioned, tied with his career high in points, closing in on that career high in goals. I'd be interested to see, especially if you say that he, you know, potentially might bypass the AHL after next season. I'd be interested to see where they start him. If he, if they feel if he's a, a top six guy or if they feel that he's best served as like a bottom six Daniel Sprong esque third line guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think really it's going to be a there's there's a perfect storm sort of brewing in that the the Penguins are are going downhill. I think a little bit more uh, rapidly. Mm. So I think there it's going to because of that it's going to give some prospects like a Braden Yeager a quicker path to getting more playing time. Um, so I think they can really like you're saying they could find out they could bring him in playing in a third line role. They could give him an opportunity in a top six to see how he responds and then you know, go from there, let him, let his play sort of dictate what the next part of the progression is. Um, but there's no, there's no doubting that he's going to be a, 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 an impact player in Pittsburgh. It's just a matter of when I think it's closer than people, other people think. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. That could be really interesting, especially because he's going to be the one that everyone turns to on the forward side of things. And you know, the year before Jaeger was drafted, the Penguins had another first round pick in Owen Pickering and, uh, you know, he got a couple of games in the AHL level last season, but spent all of this year so far back in the WHL with uh, the Swift Current Broncos. Just have you been keeping up with his year? And I mean, I haven't seen much of it, but some from what I've seen a few names on Twitter say, it looks like his, uh, his progression is plateauing a bit. I'm just curious if you've seen something like that, and is there still room for him to grow, and could a move to the AHL kind of help get him back on the right track? Yeah, plateau. That's a that's a great word for that Horwat. I think you know. I think people were really hoping. Uh, you know, I, I was really hoping at least. I'm sure like the Penguins that he was going to add another 10 to 15 points onto his offensive totals for this year, uh, and build on that sort of upward trajectory he was doing. Um, you know, he hasn't quite been there. It looks like he's probably going to just exceed it a little bit. 
Um, the Swift Current is a in a playoff position right now, so you know it's going to give him a chance to play some more meaningful hockey down the stretch as well, and maybe that will bring out more of that game. Um, but yeah, I mean, he hasn't really taken that jump that makes me think, oh, okay, he's ready to be in the NHL. It seems to me like he's got a couple more seasons to to season uh, to really get his bearings. I think he's probably going to struggle a little bit more with that. Uh, the more physically imposing players at the AHL level and the NHL level. Uh, that certainly seemed to be a big part of what where he struggled when he got to Wilkes-Barre for those few games last season. Um, but when he is in control of the game, he looks fantastic. He makes really smart decisions with the puck still. He's a great uh, puck mover. He's really good at deceiving the forwards on the forecheck, so he makes a really good outlet pass, or he's able to like skate away from that. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to still like about his game. I think it's just... Um, it's more middle pairing right now than a top pairing guy. Um, but yeah, maybe if he gets to wilkes Barre and gets another jolt, he could kind of, it, there's all of these projections are, you know, not concrete as we talk about all the time. So he can certainly change it, but yeah, I don't, I think it's been, um, a, a little bit less than an encouraging season for, for Pickering. Now of the guys we haven't mentioned, obviously the Penguins have some other, you know, prospects that are, are, twiddling about in certain leagues what is one name that we haven't mentioned that you always think of when you're saying all right if it's not one of the top guys this guy always intrigues me if it's a, a zom plant or if it's a sergey murashev over in, in russia obviously a lot has been talked about the goaltender over there he's been having a great year is there a single prospect that we haven't mentioned that comes out and stands out to you is like oh i'm excited to see where that goes because that that player is very promising from what he's shown in the league that he's in yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, Murashev for sure. I think I'm I'm partial to sort of the the European and Russian players because I think they just don't get enough love and credit for how how good they are, and it takes so much longer to get them over. Uh, but uh, Mikhail Ilyin is a name that I, I've been keeping tabs on. I mean, and he had like a really devastating injury last. Uh, I think it was last season or the season before. Uh, kept him out for a little bit of time post his draft. Uh, but he's a really good – oh, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong player. So if, if I am, forgive me. Um, but Michael Ilian is having a really strong season in the MHL over in Russia. Um, but – and he's got this sort of like – he was a seventh-round pick last year, I believe, um, or the season before, so someone can check me on that. Um, but he's got this really strong offensive game. Um, he can shoot. He's got this like – really like deceptive playmaker sort of thing going on. Um, so I think he's someone that we don't hear a lot about. He's still playing in Russia. He's in the junior league. I don't know if he's in the KHL fully this season or if he's been there for part of it. Um, but uh, he's got an offensive weaponry, and I think he's a player that, you know, he's going to probably climb up the ranks a little bit more here as he gets a bigger opportunity in the KHL. Uh, I don't think he's going to be over in North America anytime soon. Uh, but I think he's a player that we're going to have to keep tabs on. Yeah, Ilian, the fifth round pick of the Penguins in the 2023 draft, which is last year's draft, having a pretty decent season over there at the KHL level, 29 points in 65 games. But, you know, you look at the Penguins, they have a lot of names that, you know, you don't think of very much because of the fact that everybody looks at the Penguins and says, oh, they don't have a good prospect system. They're not going to have any guys that show up. Like you mentioned earlier, Jake, you know, prospect development is not linear. Sometimes people have one really good year and they shoot up the boards and they shoot up into their potential. And you never know when this diamond in the rough is going to come out. So Ilian, certainly a name that I've heard this year for the first time, obviously he was drafted last year, but sort, sort of around this last couple of weeks when ping, people started actually talking about the Penguins prospect system a little bit more in depth, that's a name that's come up. So it's interesting as to where he's going to end up. But, you know, you look at all these guys, you know, Ponomarev, Koivunin, you know, Lucius, Jaeger, Pickering. Some of these guys might end up in Wilkes-Barre this year. You know, mm -hmm. do you think if maybe a Ponomarev or maybe, you know, Pustin after the Penguin season goes down there, do you think Wilkes-Barre has what it takes to take down the mighty Hershey Bears this year? Or do you just think that is an unbeatable, unstoppable force over there in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania and Hershey? Man, I tell you what, it's it seems to be like the mecca of the American Hockey League, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. it, it, it is a tough tough team to beat. I tell you, it, it's going to be exciting. I don't know, you know, if if playoff hockey in Pittsburgh is going to be happening or even exciting. <laughs> he said optimistically, um, yeah. but there's probably going to be playoff hockey happening in Wilkesbury. So, I mean, that's something to keep an eye on. I, I think they're probably a first round exit team, but um, they're going to probably mirror their their big club, but. 
I'd love to watch a, you know, a series go the distance between them and Hershey. That's just, it's the AHL is just fun to watch, man. If you get the chance to do it, it's just, it's kind of like a, the wild west at times still, but like, man, it, it is entertaining hockey. Always is. I mean, I caught an ECHL game, <clears throat> excuse me, earlier this season and uh, in the, it was, I caught a wheeling game in the midst of that long winning streak. They just went on mm. uh, and you know, nothing too you know, feisty broke out, but yeah, the, those leagues are, they're entertaining as all get out. So absolutely. If, uh, if the penguins, the NHL penguins, that is don't make it, uh, I'm sure I'll be trying to find a way to watch uh, those AHL penguins do something, if anything, just to give uh, some entertaining value to, uh, this organization. You need a Motel 6 room and some AHL credentials, Warlock. we got to send you to Wilkes-Barre we'll if they make the playoffs. I might need a break after this year, but okay. <laughs> hey, fair enough, fair enough. But hey, nonetheless, playoff hockey might be in the Penguins organization somewhere. Some of these players that we talked about today could be participating in those playoffs so it'll be interesting to watch interesting to follow along but thank you so much jake for joining us and you know you can follow him on x at jake underscore at speed anything else you want to mention really quick plug any stories you have coming up plug anything you have coming up uh before we let you go on this episode of the tip of the iceberg yeah i mean if you want to see, read more about what I, I think about some of these players coming back in the genso trade i have a piece that went up recently about that uh and then i'll just be giving my opinions whether you want to hear it or not about the rest of the penguin season uh and then you know shout out to both of you guys and next you guys are just the best um so yeah keep keep on keeping on guys thank you we appreciate all the work you do too <laughs> we're going to take a quick break when we return the final segment of this episode of the tip of the iceberg Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. And one last shout out and thank you to Jacob Puntori for joining us on the show. Check out his work at Inside the Penguins as well. But we're going to finish off this episode. The way that we want to start finishing off episodes every Tuesday is get you guys involved, the listener, a little bit more often, a little bit more frequently, and reviving a segment that I feel like everybody enjoyed, which is the Weekly Pens Poll, Horwat. And this is what we asked to kick things off on the second iteration of Weekly Pens Poll. We're going to keep this going, basically, hopefully, through the remainder of our, our days on Tuesdays, <laughs> uh, making sure the third segment is the Pens Poll. We asked on Monday afternoon, as of now, would you pencil Valtteri Pustinen into the Penguins' top six for the start of next season? You guys voted on X at Iceberg Podcast. 57% said yes. You would pencil him into the top six for the start of next season. 43% said no. And there were a couple comments, most of them saying probably a third line role is what's best for Valtteri Pustinen. So Horwat, let me ask this to you. Would you pencil Pustinen in to the Penguins top six for 2024-25 at this moment? Yeah, I think I would. Uh, very easily almost. Uh, judging by, without making any outside additions, um, just trying to draw up a lineup cons considering only the forwards that are in the in the organization already and only by subtraction uh, who I think will or should be departing this summer. He still flies into the top six as um, Evgeny Malkin's right winger, or if you want to adjust Malkin and throw him on a, on, on another wing, he's still in the top six as some, as somebody f fills into center there. Uh, that's just my thought of it. I get where people will come from with the bottom six because we just don't know what's coming this summer. We don't know what kind of additions are going to be made. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Kyle Dubas goes out and gets a piece that obviously fits above Valtteri Pusin in this situation um, and provides that scoring, you know, which is still something the Penguins need. But for now, I'd say without knowing the outside additions that could come in, yes, with this roster right now going into next season, Valtteri Pusin is easily uh, still right where he is in that top six initially I agreed with you right off the bat it, at first I was like okay this is an easy answer it's a definite yes and then you start to think a little bit more about the construction of this team right now in the top six obviously you're going to have Sidney Crosby of Guinea Malkin down the center there's guys that you know we're going to be top six wingers going into next season and no are not going to depart aka a Michael Bunting who was just acquired and has two years left on his contract he can be penciled into the top six he's a guy that has played in the top six 
four Kyle Dubas teams in the past. And then there's Brian Rust, who has that no trade clause, who you expect fully to not be going anywhere this summer. But then it gets a little murky. Riley Smith or Carter Kell, what does their future have in store? Because if both of them end up coming back, which I, I highly doubt, but there's still a chance that both of them end up coming back, I feel like that bounces Pustinen. And the biggest thing for me is, while well, yes, I've enjoyed watching Pustinen this year, 33 games played his first actual long-term stint as an NHLer, but only two goals. Yeah, he has 13 points in 33 games, and that's not horrible, especially for a guy that's trying to adjust to the league on a team that is one of the worst in finishing in the National Hockey League. But two goals does worry me a little bit, and it makes it seem like maybe he's just playing a little bit above the level that he should. Maybe he's playing up one slot and one rung above where he would be a perfect fit at this stage of his career. And maybe that's a third line of Drew O'Connor, Lars Eller, and Valtteri Pustinen, and then maybe some outside source coming in as a top six. So I think it is a little bit more difficult of a question to answer at this stage of the game because, like you mentioned, you don't know who's going to come in. You don't know the fate of a Ricard Raquel or a Riley Smith. But I think that what he's shown is that he deserves to be an NHLer at the start of next season. He deserves to have one, two, or three legs up on the competition on whoever's brought in to be in that bottom six, especially. But the top six, I think it's going to get a little bit more murky whenever you start to see how the offseason plays out. No doubt. And, and I didn't even consider uh, the statistics whenever, you know, this whenever I was answering this question. I didn't think of the just two goals in 30-some games, despite already being in the top six. I think his playmaking ability has kind of hit another level here, at least. There are some positives to sort of lean on when it comes to the numbers but he seems like he's getting shooting opportunities he's taking those opportunities to fire the puck a little more maybe next season comes with more goals because he'll have started there in the NHL level that is he'll started there he'll have that extra confidence coming out of the out of the preseason out of the training camp um, a little more tutelage of man just fire the puck just fire away just keep you're gonna you're gonna find the net if you just keep keeping on um, and who knows, maybe what some different assistant coaches uh, have <laughs> something to say. So it's yeah. there's all kind of factors that could go into about Terry Pustin. But even with those numbers, I get where you're coming from with just two goals isn't enough to uh, sustain a spot in the top six. I'd say he starts in the top six at least. And then if it does continue to not stick uh, or if he does continue to not score at the pace we're all expecting, then, yeah, maybe you drop him down then. But, I mean, still, just as I look at the lineup, though, uh, when it comes to the wingers for next season, barring any new additions, I mean, you're putting Jesse Pugliarvi up there. I mean, he's barely no. getting ice time right now. Uh, you're certainly not putting Emil Bemstrom up there, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and who else is there? Uh, like I said, just judging by inside movements and you know, obviously Ricard Raquel might still be there to take that slot. So mm -hmm. there are names that could take it over, but, um, I just feel like it's his spot to lose almost. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing too. He's 24 years old, Yeah. right? And I know Penguins fans don't get this very often, but he has a lot of room to grow. <laughs> we haven't had a player like that in a long time in this organization and on this team. He has a lot of room to grow. Now, this is his first opportunity, 33 games. Remember what we saw from Drew O'Connor, his year-over-year -year progression from year one to year two to where he's at right now. And now he's he's been looked at as a guy that's a, a middle sixer. We're coming into the season, the conversations around Drew O'Connor were, yeah, can he just stick at the NHL? That's going to be the big thing. Can he play all 82 games? Can he be not a fourth liner? Can he, can he actually stick and produce enough to be a third liner? And here we are at this point in the season, some of it being because of necessity based on everybody else's progression and everybody else's injury status. But he spent more of the season in the top six than he has in the bottom six this season. Mm -hmm. So is that the type of progression you see from Valtteri Pustin? I think that's going to be something to key in on, especially over the summer. Where does he go from here? How does he build upon what he was able to do in these 36 games? Because if you look at the underlying numbers too, they're strong. They're very strong for Valtteri Pustin. 53% of the shot attempts at five on five. 58% of the expected goals at five on five through 33 games. So it's a large sample size. This guy has an offensive knack that fits in the NHL. He just needs to build consistency and he needs to finish. And that's a huge thing for basically this entire organization, yeah. but specifically a guy who 
listen, he, he's going to be a restricted free agent in the summer. He's currently making 775 K. He's not going to command much more than that. I mean, not with two career NHL goals, but it's it's going to be a good cheap option for your middle six. I just don't know if I could pencil him into the top six, knowing that Kyle Dubas is going to go under the knife and have some surgery on this forward lineup in the coming months. Yeah, it is that uncertainty of what is going to be brought in, of who's going to be available without looking at free agents and not even looking at free agents, but not looking at who could return in certain trades. Who knows if Kyle Dubas hits the hits the off season and goes, I know we're trying to get younger and more skilled, but you know what kind of piece could bring in a young, a young skilled asset. And that is Valtteri Pustin. You just never know what Kyle Dubas is going to bring and mm-hmm. what he's going to do because you have to also consider, you know, once the summer starts, this is when that conversation really steps up. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are the Kyle Dubas guys and who are the Ron Hextall, Jim, Jim Rutherford guys. Who's from which GM era are these players? And that's, gonna play a big factor into things too i know it's a bit more of an understated factor during the season but that is something that really does ramp up during the offseason mm-hmm. when those moves are a bit more prevalent um so you go, you're gonna end up seeing guys like jesse pool yarvin and emil benstrom probably catch a bit more of a push from dubis at least in certain offseason aspects whereas maybe jonathan gruden maybe valtteri pusin kind of get not the shaft but get put on the back burner Mm-hmm. for guys that Kyle Dubas has brought in himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's always something where, you know, who knows who from Sault Ste. Marie is going to be available this offseason. Like that, you got to know. You got to look into that because, you know, Kyle loves his Sioux guys. You know, the Sioux were so effing good, though. But, you know, at the end of the day, you look at the top six and the way that it can, it's constructed. I like the the fact that Dubas is kind of shaking things up a little bit. Michael Bunting mm-hmm. is a is a different type of player than we've seen in the Penguins' top six in a long time. Even Valtteri Pustin is a different type of player, different caliber of player than we have seen in the top six. It's been a lot of similar type guys. You know, Ricard Raquel, Riley Smith, they feel like two sides of the same coin. And you can really kind of throw Brian Rust in there. The only difference is Brian Rust has a little bit more breakaway speed. Brian Rust plays a little bit better defense. You know, and then there's Jake Gensel, who was everything that these guys were, but at a higher level. It feels like you know bunting is a much different character feels like pustinen doesn't really fit into that particular mold so i would like to see some more of these fresh faces fresh play styles get into the penguins top six and i think pustinen is part of that now at the end of the day though it needs changed like you can't say all right well you look at what you have now under contract you have bunting you have smith you have raquel you have rust you have pustinen you have o'connor you have all these options but guess what this is for a team that is going to finish, as of right now, they're they're trending to finish in the bottom 10 in the National Hockey League. You need to make some drastic changes, and changing up the bottom six isn't going to be enough. I think the defense needs to be high priority, but you know, right behind it is figuring out what to do to get some more scoring because that has been, you know, on paper and on the eye test, the Achilles heel of the Penguins this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's going to be changes no matter what. Um, you don't know if those players that you just mentioned will still be here. I think Michael Bunting will obviously stick around, and for what it's worth, tell you what, Pittsburgh's going to love him. He's not going to be Jake Gensel good, but Pittsburgh, this this fan base is going to love this guy. He ha- he brings that Patrick Hornquist type stick to the front of the net. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen him do it too much yet, but get under an opponent's skin. Uh, there are certain aspects that I think this fan base will really enjoy, and we'll just see what happens with Riley Smith and Ricardo Kell, really. It's I think Brian Russ sticks around at least through his no-move clause in his contract. It's, as for Smith and Raquel, I mean, I went on a little mini rant to myself about this yesterday. <laughs> I think I texted you about it. Just uh, who, who, why did we, why were we all expecting them to be traded? Really? Who, who was going? Kyle Dubas wanted futures. He wanted prospects rather than picks. Who's gonna trade? Who's gonna trade away their top prospects for a cooked Riley Smith? Who's going to trade away their top prospects for an expensive and long-term Ricard Raquel? It just wasn't going to happen. Smith more likely than Raquel because Raquel's long-term contract makes that very, very difficult, especially right. in the middle of a season that is one of his worst of the past half decade. Yeah, I, I understand Raquel. Smith I was a little surprised about because I thought people would see the upside and just see it as a, a bad fit in Pittsburgh with one year left. But you know, at the end of the day, these guys didn't get moved. The consequence is you have less space to try out younger guys i mean jonathan gruden was placed on waivers yesterday we'll see 
if he gets sent down at two o'clock, if he clears at two o'clock, and if he is sent down, who comes up in relief of him? Like, do they bring up a defenseman potentially because yeah. you know you trade out Chad Ruweedle? I don't believe they called up another defenseman, so right now they're rocking with six. So, do they call up another defenseman, a Ryan Shea, a you know? Jack Rathbone maybe gets an opportunity to show something at the NHL level, or, I mean, (laughs) yep, here we are. Who's next? Or, or do they call up Sam Poulin? I don't know. I'm going to stop banging on that door because it feels like nobody's home, but you know, hopefully one day in the the last, what calendar month of this season, you know, March, mid March to mid April, we see the penguins 2019 first rounder get some opportunities, but that's going to do it for this episode. Again, thank you to Jacob Puntori for joining us, talking a little prospects. Thank you to everybody who's tuned in right now at the tip of the iceberg on YouTube at inside the penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from, but we will be back tomorrow with an iceberg to go and on Thursday with a full episode of the tip of the iceberg for right now. Excuse me. We'll see you guys next time.